guy that taught lesson studies and taught Bible studies and what happened was they, they found fault with the writings of E.G. White and they, they compared it with Bible scripture and everything. And they basically just studied themselves right out of the church. They prayed for months and months and months and months on this. What should they do? What should they do? What should they do? And they said that the Lord led them out of the church and into a Baptist church. And I was talking with him yesterday and he was agreeing with everything that I was saying because it was all Adventist, Adventism. But yet, he left the church, him and his wife. And she was working at the conference office uh, doing women's, uh, uh, doing small group ministries. And they just, not just up and left, but they said they took months and they prayed about it for months. And they left. All right, just like Ernie, you said. Ernie is, um, Ernie is relating for the camera and he's making a recording here to be, and they want to hear the comments of the students, the scholars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's commenting about a relative who um, was a staunch Seventh-day Adventist and over the course of time uh, uh, in their personal study found themselves going right out of the church. Why could that possibly happen? That could, that could really definitely happen if one starts believing an evangelical gospel within the Adventist church because if you believe an evangelical gospel, which is an anti-law gospel, then you might as well take the next step, and that is become one. And that's what they did. They became one. I says, what do you do now on the Sabbath? Uh, well, we just study. Mm -hmm. and, I, and so, but boy, was I floored. I, I, I would have never believed. In the, in the well, years. I they get the white out. Out. <laughs> Go to the Did get the white out? I want you to just think for a moment. A gospel that teaches that you can squeak into heaven with a little bit of sin is a subtle opposition to the second coming of Christ. Amen. Now, you explain that why what why that statement is true. Anyone know why that's true? Well, when Jesus comes, it says that he comes as a consuming fire, doesn't it? And if there is any sin, any little sin, whether it's conscious or unconscious, it'll be consumed away, won't it? So Jesus knows that. And he's not going to come prematurely unless he has a people who he has, has purified so that they can stand the heavenly burnings when he comes. Comforted by it. There you go. And then they'll welcome him. And they'll be like, like those three Hebrew worthies who went into the burning fiery furnace with Jesus. And their hair wasn't singed. See? Now, it, Jesus has provided a way by which the second coming can be happy news. You know what? Most people don't think of the second coming as happy news. They think of it as bad news. Why is that? It's because they're not, they're not really in love with Jesus and they don't know how to get in love with him and they don't want to meet God. <laughs> That'll be a bad day <laughs> when they have to meet him face to face. But Jesus has some good news for us, how to make his second coming a happy event for us. And that is, he has a heavenly sanctuary by which he proposes to cleanse us from sin. So, if we teach a gospel that says, oh, it's okay if you sin occasionally, that's not in harmony with the cleansing of the sanctuary truth, and it's, not in har it's a subtle opposition to the second coming of Christ. Hmm? Too much on grace rather than the law. You got to balance between those two. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. 
Good. That's not, right? not for us to balance. It's for God to balance. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We balance through. I it. always, I always hesitate when someone yeah. says we need balance. We have a version of that. It's love and logic. Yeah. In my mind, that's what I see. Okay. All right. Uh, you didn't get his comments here, <laughs> but. Um, All right, well, I want you to just be careful when you read your Sabbath school lesson, for, for at least for last week. We're actually, we're, we're teaching a Sabbath school lesson a week ahead in advance, and we're on the second lesson today, whether you realized it or not. <laughs> because this goes up on YouTube, and uh, Henry has a way of putting it up on the internet, and we're now getting hits from uh, Poland and from South America and from Mexico and and I've had more questions about this lesson over the internet from people uh, from seeing YouTube and praise the Lord for that you know it's kind of stirring people's pure minds to, to be thinking uh, but the way that the the in the loom of heaven statement is presented in your lesson stay there on the in the first week and it's in the introductory uh, paragraph there from the youth instructor it's interpreted to mean the legal garments of Christ's robe of righteousness and this is an attempt to distinguish legal justification from sanctification in fact on the Sabbath lesson the, there's a statement that the author or authors seek to interpret the loom in the loom of heaven statement by saying what a wonderful image of the righteousness of Jesus the righteousness that covers anyone and then on Thursday's lesson it says we must keep distinct theologically the imputed righteousness of Christ the righteousness that justifies us from the work that the Holy Spirit does in us to change us do you notice the word theologically we must Okay, I, I, the, the last statement was on Thursday's lesson where it says we must keep distinct theologically the imputed righteousness. Whenever someone puts in the word theologically, a red flag goes up in my mind because I ask myself, well, it might be theological, but is it bibl biblical? Is it Bible? Does the Bible distinguish between the imputed righteousness and the imparted righteousness of Christ. And I don't see it. There is only one righteousness. Where, did, where is its source? It's from Christ. So the person that Christ forgives, he also, by the same righteousness, imparts the power to overcome sin. And I don't see how you can distinguish the one righteousness. So I'll tell you why the attempt they're using, like a they're using theological they're using theological language here to say that the justification of Jesus righteousness to forgive your sins is absolutely perfect and flawless you're covered it's like the woman who wears a leopard skin coat we talked about last week the perfect illustration she wears this cloak to cover what's underneath. But is the leopard coat hers? Is it part of her? No, it covers her. But the leopard wears his leopard skin and it is a part of him. And so that which Christ cloaks us with is a part of us like our skin. And that's an illustration of both imputed and imparted righteousness. But what the author is seeking to do here is to distinguish between the two because he's saying, well, what Jesus works out in us in terms of his righteousness can never rise to the level of what is imputed to us. Do you see that? Can never rise to that level. In other words, there's an excuse for sin in here. Yes, I see that. And it is a very subtle anti-law gospel. Now the reason that, uh, that you have to understand that these theologians have other little things going on in the back of their mind. They say that when we're born into this world, 
uh, we're born with a sinning nature. So if you come into this world sinning, there's no way that you can hope to exit the world except by sinning. And so what happens is that Jesus has this magic wand when he comes a second time and then he zaps it out of you at the second coming. <laughs> All right, that's the teaching of original sin, that you're born into this world sinning. In other words, Adam has made you sinning. You have inherited something from Adam and you are sinning as a result of that. You didn't, you're not responsible for it, but uh, nonetheless you're born with it. And that's not Bible. The Bible teaches that we do have a DNA inheritance from Adam through our parents, 